Hello everyone. Uh, this is a second part to that uh, the video I did on uh, you know the question are conditioners or conditioning is it is it better today than in the past or were uh, the conditioners and the conditioning of the and animals the individuals better in the past you know and uh, I'm gonna cover some of these it may sound repetitive because a lot of the uh, a lot of the responses you know this came from a post in my group a lot of the responses were similar right but you can always take those and go off to something else you know uh, include other things and talk about other things you know the first thing regards to what era we're in uh, the first thing that matters the most is the dog itself. You know, what type of individual are you using? Does uh, how did that that dog, male or female, meet your standards? To say this dog is worth conditioning. And uh, are there factors involved that help the individual get to that point? Meaning how you raise them what you feed them, how you condition them, or how you work them, exercise them, if you will, during their life. Uh, which individuals did they come from, whether it's bloodlines, family of dogs, but more importantly, particular individuals, what was their sire and dam like, grandparents, great-grandparents, you know. It's a lot of information that you need to that helps you determine the quality of that dog, you know. Is he a representative of his family? Is he an outstanding individual that happens to have a lot of the same traits that different dogs in his pedigree had? You know, what, what makes him so good? Why would you use him? That includes temperament, behavior, physical traits, build, structure, teeth. You know, there's a lot to it. So this is from uh, Bound for Glory, good people, friend of mine, and it says nutrition feed supplements, raw feed, you know. Uh, some of the things I didn't mention was like RF1, something that came up with my in my uh, in my uh, interview with Mr. Leander Daigle was he used a pre-digested dog kibble pre-digested means basically that uh enzymes are added to the food it just makes it easier and smoother for the dog to digest the food right something that was important to him in his day it's something and i was around probably at the tail end of his day right but it's not something that that uh that was talked about or that a lot of people uh mentioned using and that could be that you know people used it but they didn't share the information right so i'm not saying he was the only one who did it but he's the only one i've talked to in all those years that ever mentioned using pre-digested dog food kibble so there's something to that you know and it'd be kind of like you know when you uh you know make pickles you know the pickling of of cucumbers you know to make pickles that's kind of the concept behind pre-digested food, you know. And uh, uh, we all know that, that if you add enzymes to food, it helps you digest the food better, breaks down the food faster, you know. People use probiotics, like I mentioned before. Some people do give enzymes, you know. And it's a matter of calculating how much to give how often could be in your daily feed but it's like anything else too much is not good not enough is better and the right amount is perfect so that would just be a matter of researching uh, either pre-digested food if you if you want to try it or researching enzymes and uh, you know the benefits of them how much to give by weight or uh, age Maybe, you know, 
Uh, I haven't done the research on it. I'm familiar with enzymes. I had a couple of dogs that I fed enzymes to pretty much their whole life because they had a uh, pancreas problem, right? And I don't think it was genetic. I think it was my mistake because I fed them whole raw cow's milk when they were young. And I later learned that that's not good for them. It can mess up their pancreas. So I think that was my fault. But when I took him to the vet, he advised me to give him enzymes in their daily feed. They never had a problem with it, you know. Uh, even before that, I didn't see any noticeable problems in their stool or digestion or anything like that. Them getting sick. But it was something that came up when I took a stool sample in. So I just gave them enzymes the rest of their life. But I think that was that's what it was from. And I learned to it's better goat milk is better for them so we would give that to pups you know it helps with their teeth helps with their bone it's a better dairy product if you will for them you know so uh you know some of the other things would be uh you know uh the subject of dex comes up you know and in the past, you know, Mayfield talked about giving hormones. I would suggest, I would guess that it was probably equipoise, you know, because he learned it from Tudor and Sadler, and their vet was a horse doctor who advised them on a lot of stuff. You know, as far as I know, they were the first ones to start using uh, blood tests in their dogs. <laughs> and it wasn't done a lot back then, I don't guess. If it was, again, people didn't talk about it. Uh, during my time, even before, a little before my time, and during my time and after my time, most assuredly, the blood tests became a standard within a lot of conditioners, you know. And that would be one thing that's different from uh, more modern type conditioning or conditioners and those of the past. You know, I didn't even have access to it. I could take my dogs in when they were young and have a blood test done with my vet uh, just to make sure they were healthy and everything was right, which I did. But during their careers, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Uh, not with the, you know, the visible uh, physical examples, if you will, <laughs> you know. I just, I just wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I didn't feel comfortable doing that because at that time, you know, vets were, they had to, they had to say something if they, if they thought something was wrong, you were doing something illegal with your animals. Kind of like, you know, you take your kid to the doctor and they see bruise and this and that, they have to report it to the police. So it became a law among veterinarians that they had to report you if they thought you were doing something illegal. So I couldn't do that. Uh, nowadays, you, you buy the unit at home, you know, unit for home use. You can draw the blood, put it in the tester, and it gives you a readout of uh, uh, of the blood. Uh, uh, HCT and, and uh, uh, what's the other one? I forget the other one, but, you know, I've seen them. People have shown me examples, you know. That you'd have to learn how to read it, how to use the unit, and uh, how to read it, and then what do the results mean. So, like people always say, there's more access to info, which is true. All that info about that unit, blood tests, what they mean, what they show, uh, how does it relate to the health of the dog, that you can learn that, you know, and uh, which could help you. And again, you know, you'd have to practice. Uh, you can practice when the dogs are young, when they're older, before conditioning, after conditioning, during a keep, all that stuff, you know. Uh, it's pretty simple, and people swear by it. So that would be one thing that would help uh, improve conditioning, and is one difference from current days to the past days. Uh, the other thing, people use, you know, they've always used... Uh, not always, but uh, at Dex, probably back 
during that time Mayfield was talking about, you know, uh, Dex was used, right? And then people usually relate it that that's how they make weight, you know, because what it does is makes a sugar level rise in the dog and that makes them urinate more. That's how you get rid of all those fluids. But it, always ha it also has uh, the properties of anti-swelling and it's an anti-pain medication also. It was almost standard that everybody used it after a show. And a lot of people used it before the show to quote unquote make weight, right? Uh, but there's different kinds, you know. How do you know which one to use? My advice always has been uh, use human grade uh, supplements or human grade decks as far as this goes. Uh, if you're going to use it on your dog, you know, there's some out there for bovine and, uh, you know, equine and bovine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest using those. I wouldn't advise that. Not that I know personally, but like I said, I talk to a lot of people. And the ones that I consider good at what they do, that's the advice they gave me. Don't use the equine bovine one. Use the human grade. Even my supplements, you know, I've talked about, uh, you know, I use Dog Bloom VM Supreme. I have friends that use uh, Genesis with good results. But the other stuff I use, the Carboplex, Aminos, B15, Desiccated Liver, they're all human grade. grade. And you just adjust it to the weight of the dog, the size of the dog. So let's say if it's Carboplex, they tell you give a cup to an adult human, I would give a quarter cup to a dog. That simple, you know. Something tells you to use, uh, you know, uh, uh if you're using pills, let's say for an adult, it says use four pills or whatever for an adult human, I would give them one if I was using some kind of pill, you know. The stuff I used was powdered. Most of it was powdered. Sometimes the aminos I used were pills, and that's what I did. You know, I, I think the suggestion on the bottle was four pills a day, you know, uh, before a workout. So I would just use one. And that was kind of the slurry I used, carbs and aminos. Mix them up. People are against carbs. They're, they're anti-carb and all this and that. And I've had people tell me I, I I didn't feed my dog carbs. Well, I turn around and tell them, show me your feed and I'll tell you what what carbs you have in them. So if you're going to say that, just say you don't add extra carbs to their food. Because just about everything uh, you feed them in your makeup of your dog food, there's some carbs in there somewhere. Whether you lose using legumes or rice or sweet potato or pumpkin or, you know, honey, sugar, fruit, anything. Oh, those are carbs. Simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates, you know, all turns to energy. And, uh, you know, there's an article in the Sporty Dog Journal put out by Bob Fritz. And he mentions uh, the right carbs to use, you know. Which ones are the right ones? So, again, do your research. Which ones would be beneficial, not for performance, but which ones are beneficial for dogs? Because in a lot of ways, dogs and humans are the same. But according to Bob, when it comes to carbs, uh, they're different. They're different for humans compared to for dogs, right? The carbs he used were... You know, that you didn't get that high uh, uh, buildup of uh, lactic acid, you know. They absorbed better. They were beneficial throughout the workout, throughout the keep. It didn't make your dogs run hot, you know. Something that, that Bulldog P mentioned, you know. He kept it simple because you give them all this stuff. And that's what it does. It makes your dog run hot. That's what he observed through his years of conditioning and he was one of the best in uh, in the deep south and competed amongst and against some of the best in in that whole deep south area 
so that was his advice to me one time you know keep it simple don't add a lot of stuff a lot of supplements this and that because people what happens is they start you know well this looks good that looks good i'll add that i'll throw this in there i'll put in you're compounding it compounding it and building up and you're giving them the same stuff or you're giving them things that already have uh, in one supplement, the, it's the same stuff it has in the other supplement. So between the two, there may be different uh, ingredients, but they're also going to have the same ingredients. So now you're doubling up on a particular ingredient that's in both of them, and it ends up being too much. What's happened with like the Genesis and the, even the RF1 and different ones, what they're doing is they're putting all these uh, active ingredients, all these supplements that are beneficial to conditioning, they're putting it in one unit, basically. And that would all you'd have to use, all you would need to use as far as adding supplements to your dog food. So rather than giving them this and that, you know, I like giving the individual stuff because I can measure it for each particular dog, right? And you can do that with the all included ingredients, right? And that's the reason they did that. You can still do that. That's what makes it simpler. So you would get your feed, whatever your feed is, and then add this one supplement that's all inclusive, basically. And you don't have to give them anything else. And that should be enough. So, uh, uh, another one uh, came up from uh, Siron Frat, uh, Frank. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Siron Frank or Siron Frank. Frank. Access to info is better, right? That's what he said. But the conditioner matters, right? And we've gone over that, you know, access is better. Uh, there's a lot more information and it's almost instantaneous. But the one thing he said about the conditioner matters, that, that's true. Has to be someone with experience. You have to either have the experience uh, from early on, you know, which some guys get that because they're, they're born into the dog, you know. But generally you gain that experience over time. So the experience of that handler matters as it pertains to the particular dog. You know, you have to know how to read dogs. What's the best conditioning program for this particular dog? You've heard that, you know. Even though most of the people I talk to use the same stuff, whatever methods they're using, cat meal, treadmill, this and that, and a mix of both or whatever, they basically do the same. What changes is the... Uh, Either the time, the length of time for the workout or the length, the distance for the workout, you know. One dog, you may be able to run them 15 miles next to a bike. Another one, maybe only 8 or 10, you know. You can keep it where you have an average, you know. That's what I did. Between 8 and 10 to me was good enough. And the time I had in front of me, the time allotted, and... uh the the duration of the keep you know for me that 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 worked out best you know a dog with better air you know i could get them up to uh, uh 10 miles uh, a dog that and what i mean by better air a, a dog that paced itself better i could go a little longer distance uh so it's not really better air it's more a dog that understood how to pace itself, controlled its breathing better. Or as a dog that was more of the shotgun type, you know, I still tried to teach them to pace their self, but the distance they ran because they're, they're at a faster pace didn't have to be as long as the other type of dog. So that's something to take into consideration. But the, the, uh, the conditioner matters most, you know. A conditioner, you know, you've heard it said, they can take a great dog and make them greater. They could take an average dog and make it good. They can take a good dog and make it better, you know. Or if you're not good, you know, <laughs> Tudor said that, you know, you could take uh, someone who didn't know what the hell they were doing. They could take 
tutor spike and mess him up and lose with him, you know. That can happen too. Now, that being said, almost anybody, unless you're just stubborn and uh, not open to learning, almost anybody can learn how to condition dogs. Uh, that's a fact. Doesn't matter your in income level, education level. As long as you have some common sense, some patience, uh, the time to do it, and you really love what you're doing, you can learn how to condition. Some guys are better than others, you know. Uh, in that case, let, let's say someone's at a higher level than you. You're good, but he may be considered better or he has more experience or he's better at it, right? Uh, one of the ways to counteract that was to have a better dog than they did. Because ultimately, that's what matters most is the dog you're using. It doesn't always happen. That scenario could come up, and it has come up. So that's one way you have to look at it. You know, I can condition good, but I got a real good dog. He's going to make up for any little faults I have. Where that doesn't play out is I'm a great conditioner, and I got a great dog, and nobody's going to whip this dog, and that happens too. A dog like Art, Zebo. Uh, more modern dogs, uh, you know, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, May Day or a couple of sons of his. I'm forgetting now, you know, some of the Black Rock dogs, you know, he was a good conditioner when I knew him. Uh, great conditioner, if you want to put it that way, and uh, had some very good dogs, you know. I was just talking... In another chat on J-Bo's channel with my buddy Dave. Dave is a good conditioner. Uh, I haven't seen him in a long time, but uh, he came on the show. I was glad to see him. Man, he's just good people, but he knows his stuff, you know. And his methods are different than some people, you know. Uh, the thing we agreed on, you know, I asked him during the thing uh, he, about the food he fed and all that stuff, you know. And... Uh, I asked him, did you cook your food? He said, yeah, I cook it, you know. And I said, well, there's someone who agrees with me because I cook mine too. People are always telling me, oh, you shouldn't cook the food. It takes the nutrients out and all that. That's been debunked. That's not true. Not to knock raw feed. Raw feed is excellent. If you like it, do it. But don't think you're going to uh, kill the in nutrients in your dog food if you cook it a little bit, you know. If you cook it to where it's leather or you cook cook it down to where it's so, you know, you wasted everything, then yeah, that, that's just common sense. You shouldn't do that. Cooking the food doesn't hurt it. And some stuff, like, uh, like, you know, uh, 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 pumpkin or, or, you know, yams or something like that, greens like that, I would suggest cooking them, you know. Your dog can get used to eating them. It's good. Maybe it cleans their teeth, you know. And, but that stuff takes a long time to digest when it's raw like that. And my buddy who fed strictly raw in his keep, he took all the ingredients, whatever it was, and he cut them into small pieces just so the dog could digest it better, faster, and get the nutrients. When you see when you see people giving, when I see people putting big chunks, you know, leg quarters or big chunks of meat or frozen this and that, you know, I understand the concept. It comes from animals in the wild. Right? And that's what they do. They kill something. They bite chunks off of it. Pieces of bone and guts. And they just swallow them. Right? But those predators in the wild. Wolves. Especially wolves and lions and stuff like that. They don't eat every day. They don't. Their digestive rate can be slower. And maybe that's why, because, you know, nature, they don't have to go out and hunt every day and kill something every single day, which would deplete the population, right? So, in their case, I see them eating big chunks of meat because over time, the digestion rate is slower. Well, we feed our dogs every day. This is just my hypothesis, right? Just my way of thinking, my common sense way of thinking. You know, if I'm going to give them a chunk of something, it's going to be something they caught their self and ate it, whether it's a chicken or a rabbit, and they eat it whole and whatever. That's 
That's their raw feed. But uh, if I'm feeding them every day like that, you know, I'm going to cut it up. I'm going to make it smaller, even the cooked meat, you know. And sometimes the chicken I gave them, you know, I didn't I didn't cook it a lot. When I cut it up, you know, it still had pink in it, you know. It wasn't all the way cooked through. That's fine. But I'm still going to chop it up because I want it to digest within that 24-hour period. From the time I feed them to the time their next workout is. And I want them to be regular. I want to time them so that they empty out at the same time every day. And so if I'm going to give them some big chunk of something, I'd give them a big old raw bone, raw beef bone, you know. And uh, I didn't use raw beef bones in keep, but I did use raw beef bones throughout their life. You know, it helps them work that jaw. They get the extra calcium. It gives them something to do if they so they don't be bored, you know. And it's good for them, along with the nutrients and helps their teeth and their jaw and the calcium and all that stuff but uh, it was too hard for me to uh, you know work with the weight when they're eating a bone during keep because it the the digestive rate is different uh, they need more fluid you know they'll have a tendency to, to it dries them out a little bit you know tendency to drink more water so it was too hard to calculate the weight and all that anyways i just didn't do it during keep it was too uh threw my my timing off if you will so if i was to feed raw i would cut it all up that's what my friend did and that was his reason behind it and it made sense to me you know so uh that's a good one mr frank you know conditioner matters uh leroy jr made the point of saying that um the sharing of info by the older guys you know and some of the guys who do it now back in the day they didn't but now they feel comfortable doing it they're retired they don't have no dogs and they'll give you that information like mr leander said about the pulley system he used, you know, uh, check out the vid, you know, that was something. And today I would just for regular exercise, I may not do it and keep, maybe I would, you know, but that was something. If I had dogs today, I would incorporate that. I'd build my little pulley system. You can pull like this and that it emulates what they're doing in the box basically. And you can tug on it and they're going to pull on it. You can let it go. They'll move around and all that. It's just real simple, you know, technique uh something like that but the older guys they didn't share stuff and now they're willing to and even guys that are not so old but they have some time in the breed they're willing to share information and i think that's important you know he said guys like me and and others you know which i've always you know i've never really held back you know some stuff i just didn't say you know I wouldn't lie about something, but I just wouldn't talk about it. And even today, there's some stuff I just won't talk about, you know, for different reasons. But for the most part, I've always been helpful. Or if I'm asked, I'm going to tell you the truth. And it matters because there's a lot of little tidbits, a lot of things here, this and that, that people just don't think about. That you gain through experience of being around animals, being around dogs, different animals, whether it's livestock or horses or whatever even if you have pet hamsters and you know stuff like that some people have snakes you just learn things that you pick up by being around them interacting with them how you feed them what their behaviors are there's very little in terms of commonality between the behavior of a dog and the behavior of a reptile of a snake or something right so you're not making that comparison but what you do learn inherently is to pay attention to the actions of the individual. And you pick up on things. And if you just have that concept in your brain, or you just have the ability to do that, you learn that whether you're learning it consciously or not so consciously. You pick up little things about the dogs, you know. 
And, uh, you know, one of the things, spring pole that's always mentioned, you know, they talk about Honey Bunch. She leaped up and broke her back and didn't land right and this and that. And I see people, sometimes they don't understand the concept of how to teach a dog to use a spring pole, for example. Right? And back in the day, we went through the process, you know. Today, they, they want the dog to do all kinds of stuff and they don't teach the dog how to do it. Or they don't have the patience to allow the dog to learn how to do it. Most people like their dogs all four feet on the ground on a spring pole. Some people are good with that. And plus, as long as they have two feet on the ground, they'll work it like that. Very few use the concept or the method of all four feet off the ground where the dog jumps up and grabs it. Because what they do... And I'm just guessing, but I would guess they do this. They want the dog to jump up off the ground and grab the hide of the spring pole, right? And they don't teach or they don't go through the process of getting to that point. They just lift it up off the ground. The dog jumps and he slips and falls and falls on his back, hurts his leg, all this stuff. Why is that? Because you didn't go teach them how to do it. You can't just go, hey, the dog works a spring pole. I'm just going to lift it up 10 feet in the air. And he's got to jump 6 feet. And grab it. No. No. That's the best way to injure your dog. And maybe that's how dogs have been injured. Because we did it all the time. My friend did it regularly. He had, you know, stuff hanging off of trees near his dog's. Uh, young and old, and whenever they wanted to grab that spring pole, so to speak, they just jump and grab it and work it. And it does work different muscles, and they do shake it. But you've got to start with four feet on the ground. Teach them how to do that. Then you work from just having two feet off the ground. This may take a couple of months where they're comfortable with it. So no matter what, where they're at, what area they're at, they learn to keep their feet on the ground. They learn to have their balance. First four feet, then two feet. While they're working the hide. Then if you want them all four feet, you just lift it incrementally, little by little, till they learn. To where it's just a hop. And once they pull down, they can still feel their feet touching a little bit. So they know the ground is there. If you do that over time, you can have it up ten feet high where they jump six feet. And when it slips out or they miss the hide, they land on their feet. And they don't flip over and twist their self and bend their leg and fall down and don't catch their self properly. So I see that as the problem today. They don't understand the concept of the spring pole. And, and uh, they're in a rush to get them to do all kinds of stuff before the dog actually learns how to do it. Because I've never seen a dog using that method I just described where you teach them little by little. And then they're up off the ground on all fours jumping for it. Whether they catch it or they slip it and miss. Or they don't land on their feet. It didn't happen in our day where they didn't land on their feet. They always landed on their feet and caught their self. Because they were cognizant of where they're at, how high they're jumping, where the ground is, and how to land. But you have to show them that. So that's uh, another tip. You know, I just I just brought up because I've seen people doing this and they, I know they did it wrong. Why is the dog falling down? <laughs> you know, how come he, how come he missed, uh, you know, when he missed the bait? Because they, they miss it sometimes, you know. Or it slips out. How come he don't have his balance? He wasn't tra taught properly in the first place. So that's, uh, you know... Uh, you get to talk to Mr. Gray and even, you know, Tim Gibbons and, and uh, Tim Gibson and Buffalo Soldier and all these different guys, you know, LA Dream Team and West Coast Combine, you know, they give you these little tips, you know, where if it was me, because I did this back in the day, I'd be taking notes, you know, and just, just have them there and then you can put them in order conditioning this and that you know what pertains to whether it's road work and you have all these tips they may help you they may not but it's information that you can refer to 
if a problem arises or you don't remember something or uh, you're not sure what to do about it. So I think that's one of the benefits of having the information readily available and instantaneous, right? But if you don't write it down, you're going to have to research it. And some stuff you're going to forget. And even if you write it down, just in everyday life, you're going to forget. But you can go to, the, hey, did I cover that? Did I mention that? Did I write that down? You know, and then you just go, okay. And then you jog your memory back or you have some information along with it. So it's not just that the information is, there's more of it and it's easily accessible. What are you going to do with that information? It has to be stored somewhere. You can store it on a computer. You can write it down. You can, but you know, uh, it, you should have it some process where you can refer to it instantaneously in your own records, rather than having to look it up and look it up and look it up. People ask me all the time. Sometimes you know different things, and sometimes I have to look them up. Sometimes it's in my brain. Sometimes I'm looking it up on Google. Sometimes I have to go through my notes because I know where it is in my notes and I have to refresh my own memory of what I'm supposed to already know. So, yes, there's benefits to having the information readily available and people sharing information, but you have to have some place where you keep this information so you can refer to it almost instantaneously yourself. Uh, so that's uh, this one's a little bit shorter than the other one. It's just some things to think about. It's up to anybody's interpretation or opinion or even experience whether uh, the conditioners of the past were better than those of today or the conditioners of today were better than those of the past or the conditioning itself was better in the past compared to today or better today compared to the past. In my opinion, with my time in the dogs over many years, I see the advancements and the improvements that are helpful and made a difference and where conditioning has evolved, has evolved and conditioners in a lot of instances are better, but also in the past there's more common sense knowledge they did more dogs generally, you know, uh, uh, in the past, competed with more dogs, had a higher record, if you will, than towards the end of my career uh, because of the laws and all that stuff. That's all it is, you know. It was more open back then. And also, they were more apt to be raised with dogs and had a certain common sense about them because they're raised with animals, different kinds of animals, that I don't see so prevalent in modern day. So for me, good in the past or great in the past, either one was at the top. Same in modern day. Good or great is the top. Compete in any area. If it was me and I had dogs, I'd put them together. Put the benefits of both together. And maybe that would raise my level just a little bit more so once again thanks for your uh, support subscriptions uh, press the like button all that stuff school baby reminds me to say it every now and again you know uh, I appreciate everybody subscribing watching the vids and putting comments in it seems like there's more and more comments which I really enjoy sometimes my responses are short because I really can't add to what you said. What you said was good. So the focus should be on what you said, not my answer. So sometimes that's why they're short. I can't add to it. Sometimes I'll, I'll uh, add more than what was said. Uh, but, um, you know, the interaction is good. And uh, there seems to be more of it. So I'm glad for that. Thanks for all the books and t-shirts and sticks and sporting dog journal reprints and all the dog registrations you've done everything's going good i'm just real busy so sometimes i don't put a video out for a couple of days or whatever or it takes me a while to respond but i will respond so again like always feel free to comment and uh, 
Got more vids coming up. More interviews too. Thank you.